Welcome to a live BYU devotional broadcast. Today, BYU Title IX Coordinator Tiffany turley Bocut will address the campus community. The devotional originates from the Marriott Center on the BYU campus. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this morning's devotional. My name is Keith Vorkink, and I am the Advancement Vice President and will be conducting this morning. We are pleased to have Tiffany turley Bocut, Title IX Coordinator at BYU, as our speaker today. We extend a special welcome to her husband, Tom, and to their family members and friends with us today. Please join us next Tuesday at this same time and place for another campus devotional when we will hear from Rachel Wadham, a senior librarian at the Harold B. Lee Library. This morning's prelude music was provided by Tarun Harding, a graduate student in organ performance from Orem, Utah. Kylie Linton, a junior studying piano performance from Eagle, Idaho, led us in singing the opening hymn. The invocation will be offered by Abigail Morrison, Deputy Title IX Coordinator at BYU. Immediately following the opening prayer, we will have an honor string quartet present, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, performed by Anna Spataro, a recent string performance graduate from Issaquah, Washington, and Parker Gardner, a senior majoring in string performance from Mill Creek, Utah, both on the violin as well as Lizzie Thorup, a junior studying string performance from Taylorsville, Utah, on the viola, and Nate Williams, a senior commercial music major from Unionville, Connecticut, on the cello. And now the prayer by Sister Morrison. Our dear Father in heaven, we come before thee with gratitude in our hearts this morning and the opportunity we have to gather here together to hear this devotional address from Tiffany Turley. We are so grateful for this beautiful campus, for the mountains, for the flowers, and for the rains that we've received this spring. We pray for thy spirit to be with us um, and with Tiffany as she speaks. We pray that we will be able to hear what Thou would have us hear, and that our ears and our hearts will be open to the ways that we can better love and serve Thee and serve our sisters and brothers here. We love Thee very much, and we are so grateful to be able to be here on this unique campus and university. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you, sisters Spataro and Thorup, and brothers Gardner and Williams, for sharing your gifts with that beautiful and inspiring music with us this morning, setting the table for our devotional address. We are privileged to have Tiffany Turley Bocut as our devotional speaker this morning. Sister Turley Bocut is the Title IX coordinator at BYU. Prior to serving in this position, she directed women's services and resources at BYU, and she also worked for the state of Utah in varying capacities. Tiffany received her bachelor's degree from BYU and her MBA from Westminster College. She is a passionate advocate for women and a certified sexual assault crisis counselor. She has spent countless hours volunteering and serving with programs, charities, and organizations that support and inspire women. Tiffany was recognized by Utah Valley Magazine as one of their fabulous 40 people of 2018. She and her husband, Tom, are the parents of three children. Following Sister Bo Bocut's remarks, the benediction will be offered by Nathan Lindsay, an animation professor in the Department of Design. Now we'll be pleased to hear from Sister Turley Bocut. Good morning. It's such an honor to speak today and honestly, a little surreal. When I was growing up, I always knew I wanted to go to BYU. In fact, when I was a sophomore in high school, Mattel came out with a collegiate line of Barbie dolls and my parents got me the BYU one because coming here is all I ever talked about. My BYU Barbie sat up on a shelf in my bedroom as my vision board of sorts because BYU was always the goal. I'm so glad it became a reality both then as a student and now with the opportunity I have to work here on campus. A few years ago, I was going through small boxes and actually found that Barbie and it now sits in my office. It's amazing how life comes full circle. BYU has always been part of my story and has blessed my life immensely. I'm grateful to this university for all that it is all that it stands for, and the ways it has changed me for the better as a student and now as an employee. One thing I've learned in my life, both when I was here at BYU and since, is that life rarely goes as expected. As mentioned, I always wanted to come to BYU, but an underlying purpose of that, and I'm going to put myself out there a little bit here, was to get married, not just to get an education. Now before you judge me too harshly, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one who's ever had that goal at BYU. In fact, in his second century address, President Spencer W. Kimball said this about that particular goal. We do not apologize for the importance of students searching for eternal companions at the same time they search the scriptures and sh search the shelves of libraries for knowledge. So I was just doing what President Kimball suggested. But when I graduated, I wasn't married. The Lord had a different plan for me than I had for myself. And looking back, I have so much gratitude for the prayers he answered, and more importantly, the ones I thought he didn't. Despite its unexpected twists and turns, the Lord has been there for me unfailingly. And I hope to testify of that in what I share today. I am certainly not a scriptorian by any stretch, or even an academic as some devotional speakers are. Rather, I'm someone who has been blessed by the Lord far more than I deserve, and someone who has felt his love throughout my life in a way that makes me want to share it with everyone I can. So today I'm going to speak from my heart in sharing some experiences I've had, as well as insights from the scriptures that have strengthened my faith and reminded me time and time again that the Lord loves us more profoundly than we can even comprehend. I often say that my life motto is, life is hard, but God is good. And I hope that through what I share today, you can see how good he's been in your life too. Even though life hasn't turned out as I expected, not getting married and having children until I was almost 40 definitely wasn't in my plans as you heard a minute ago, I can say it has turned out better in every way. And through it all, there are two important lessons I've learned and which I wanna share this morning with the Spirit's help. First, the importance of having faith in the Lord, and second, the need to have faith in ourselves. To begin, I'd like to share a story about a time in my life when my faith in the Lord and my faith in myself were tested and ultimately strengthened as I felt him by my side. On a Sunday evening in November 2020, my husband and I were doing our regular planning session for the coming week and reviewing our schedules to make sure we were on top of things. At the time, our three children were two and a half, 18 months old, and almost six months old. Having three babies under three, two full-time jobs, a husband in the bishopric, and other community and family activities definitely made for a hectic schedule. 
Recognizing it was gonna be a busy week and with individual but joint resolve that we wanted to make our gospel study more of a priority amidst the busyness of our schedules, we decided to start waking up a half hour earlier than our babies so we could begin our days with our gospel study instead of trying to fit it in somewhere else. The next morning, Monday, November 16th, we did just that. It was a peaceful morning filled with the Spirit. And as I read that week's Come Follow Me lesson in Ether chapter 6 about the Jaredites boarding their barges and commending themselves to the Lord with the hopes of reaching the promised land, I had some pretty specific impressions that I felt I needed to record. I'm grateful for the Gospel Library app that makes recording thoughts and prompting so easy. My study that morning felt especially powerful for some reason, and I was grateful I had the prompting to record my thoughts. I'm a firm believer in the power of recording experiences when we feel the Spirit teaching us. And in this case, it would prove especially meaningful in my life. As my husband Tom and I were finishing our study, we heard our sweet baby starting to stir. Our oldest two, Isaac and Zoe, shared a room, and Benny, our youngest, was sleeping in the nursery. Being a little older, and anyone with toddlers can attest to this, Isaac and Zoe had a tendency to get much louder, much quicker, if we didn't come get them right when they woke up. So we went to their room first. We got them dressed as we normally did, and then I was finishing getting them ready while Tom went to get Benny. A few seconds later, every parent's worst nightmare became our reality. Benny had stopped breathing, and despite our most desperate prayers and the heroic efforts of our first responders, our angel boy unexpectedly and tragically passed away from SIDS. Over the course of the next few days, I recognized this was an experience where the rubber met the road with my faith. Did I really believe what I've been teaching my children was true, that families are forever? Did I believe in the Lord to sustain us through what felt like an insurmountable trial and somehow make it be for our good? Did I believe that I could trust the Lord to comfort me in my pain and wipe away this brokenhearted mother's tears? I did, and I do. In some ways I know it, and in all ways I believe it. This experience in every way strengthened my faith in the Lord and reminded me in tangible ways of the importance of having faith in Him throughout our lives. Because when we do, as we learn in John 14, He will not leave us comfortless, and through Him, we will find peace that surpasses understanding. That first night that Benny passed away was without question the darkest night of my life. I couldn't sleep, so to avoid disturbing my husband, I went out to our family room. I turned on every light in the house because I was afraid that if I didn't, the darkness would overtake me. I tried everything I could think of to calm my heart, and then I turned to my scriptures because I knew they always brought me peace and light, and I desperately needed both in those moments. I opened up the Gospel Library app, and staring back at me from the screen was not only the story of the Jaredites again, but my own thoughts on having faith in and trusting the Lord when times get hard. I'd like to share some of those thoughts with you now, thoughts that I'd recorded before my world turned upside down, but which I now realize were a tender mercy from the Lord to one of his daughters who would soon be in need. From verse 3, the Lord doesn't want us to live in darkness and will do his part to help us live in light, but we have to have faith in him and do our part. From verse 4, sometimes I feel like we have to do this in our lives, just commend ourselves to the Lord and take a big leap of faith. It's reassuring to read scriptural examples of people who also did that. From verse 7, the vessels were so well built that the water couldn't penetrate them. That didn't stop the storms, but it did protect them. We will face rough waters in our lives, but we can build our testimonies such that outside forces can't penetrate them. It's up to us. From verse 8, the Lord knew what he was doing. Even though he was sending winds, those winds were getting the people to the promised land. In our lives, trials may seem difficult and sometimes like we're going to drown, but if we trust the Lord, everything will keep pushing us to where he needs and wants us to be. And from verses 9 and 10, I don't think it's a coincidence that the verse about how they couldn't be broken and they had light always comes after the scripture about how they praised the Lord always. Gratitude is such a game changer. Now, none of this was groundbreaking, but reading these again with the perspective I now had of losing our angel son, I was amazed to think the Lord loved me so much that he would have his Holy Spirit inspire me to write down thoughts that just moments later would take on new meaning in my life and be an anchor for my faith that I would need in the coming days and months. Two days later, Tom and I went to purchase a burial outfit for Benny. As we were standing at the register to pay, I noticed the return policy sign behind the desk. 
Tears immediately started flowing as I realized that return policy didn't apply to us because this tiny white outfit would be going into the ground to be buried with our son. Not a second later, though, the song, Be Still My Soul, came over the speakers. Talk about a tender mercy. And the second verse particularly spoke to my heart. Be still my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he has the past. I then had this flash moment when I was able to look back on my life and see instance after instance where the Lord had been there for me and carried me through. So I knew I could trust and have faith that as this song said, he would undertake to guide my future as he'd always guided my past. I could have faith in him moving forward because I'd had so many experiences with him before. I knew who he was. I knew that he loved me and was aware of me. And because of that, I knew I could trust him. My faith was based on who he was, not on who I expected him to be, or even who I thought I needed him to be during that particular experience. Looking back, I have so many moments, including the days and weeks after Benny passed away, that I liken to my own walks along the road to Emmaus. Just like those disciples, I'm confident the Lord has always been by my side, even though at times I might not have seen him. Whether it's because I wasn't looking or because I was expecting something different, I'm grateful that also like those disciples, eventually my eyes have been opened and I've been able to recognize the miracles he's provided along the way. In fact, once I started looking for the wonders the Lord was working in the days and weeks after Benny passed away, I was simply amazed. There were so many miracles that I started capturing, capturing them in an online journal, walkswithbenny.com, because I didn't ever want to forget how good the Lord was to us. Every miracle brought us closer to Him, and I love looking back on them now as they continue to strengthen my faith in the Lord and in His love. In order for us to have faith in the Lord, we have to get to know Him. And one of the beautiful things I found in learning about the Lord is the more I learn about Him, the more I also learn about myself and who I am to Him. I've had many moments throughout my life, as I'm sure we all have, when I definitely don't feel worthy of His sacrifice and love. But as I've struggled through those moments, clinging to who I know He is and focusing on my faith in Him, I feel He has also reminded me to have faith in myself. One of my favorite quotes comes from a devotional Elder L. Tom Perry gave here at BYU in 1974. During his address titled, Be the Best of Whatever You Are, he said, One of the greatest weaknesses in most of us is our lack of faith in ourselves. I know this is something I've struggled with in my life. As Elder Perry says, I think it's something we all struggle with from time to time. But as I thought about this over the years and considered the importance of having faith in myself to work through life's challenges, I've come to see <clears throat> just how important this is to the Savior. We need to have faith in Him, but He also wants us to have faith in ourselves. Every day I work with individuals facing trauma, and I wish I could speak this truth into their hearts and let them know how much the Lord loves them and wants them to believe in themselves because that knowledge can make a powerful difference in our healing and growth. We are all children of God. It's one of the first things we learn in primary because it's one of the most foundational things we can teach our children and remind ourselves. I've been singing the song, I am a child of God to my children since before they were born. And each time I do, I feel such a powerful witness that indeed they are children of God and that I as their mother have a precious and timely stewardship to help them understand that too. In a recent YSA devotional by President Russell M. Nelson, which many of you hopefully saw, our dear prophet said, I believe that if the Lord were speaking to you directly tonight, the first thing he would make sure you understand is your true identity. My dear friends, you are literally spirit children of God. Knowing this can help us have faith in ourselves to accomplish great things. So to remind you of that this morning, I wanted to share a short video. I am a child of God, and He has sent me Me. 
realize I may be biased, but I hope those incredibly adorable children help to remind you of your importance as a child of God, and that because of his son, we can withstand the storms of life, accomplish great things, and return to live with him someday. One of my favorite scripture stories is found in the 14th chapter of Matthew in the New Testament. It's a well-known story, but there are some additional insights I found during my study of it in recent years that I'd like to share, because I believe they illustrate the Savior's desire for us to have faith in ourselves. As we know from the writings of Matthew, some of the Savior's disciples were asleep on a boat when a storm hit. They were afraid until they looked out and noticed the Savior walking toward them on the water. And he said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. The Savior knew that by making himself known to them, their fears would cease and they could be of good cheer. If we have faith in him, as these disciples did, and as we've been talking about this morning, his counsel can be the same in our lives. But that's not where this story ends. Peter then indicates his desire to walk on the water and go toward the Lord. I think sometimes Peter gets a bad rap for this, but I actually really admire his desire to move toward the Lord and get out of the boat. It took faith in the Lord and himself to do so, to even attempt to walk on water, and he did it. Peter was experiencing a miracle as long as he kept his eyes focused on the Lord. But then we learn in Matthew 14, 30 that Peter saw the wind boisterous and was afraid, which caused him to sink. When he did, he looked up and said, Lord, save me. I love the next verse where it says, and immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. The Lord is always right there as soon as we are willing to look to him and believe. The Lord then said to Peter, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? While many have taken this to be referring to Peter's doubting the Lord, I think there might be a deeper meaning in this story that the Lord is trying to teach us. In my mind, Peter didn't doubt the Lord. In fact, Peter trusted and had such faith in the Lord that when he started to sink, he knew the Lord could and would save him. What I think the Lord might be saying here is, Peter, why did you doubt yourself? I think the Lord's comment to Peter is a reminder of his own strength and ability to experience miracles, as he had done in walking on the water as far as he did. I don't necessarily think the Lord is chastising Peter for lacking faith in him, because Peter's faith in him seemed pretty clear when he reached up asking to be saved. Who Peter doubted was himself, and I think that's an important lesson we can learn from this story that has the potential to be overlooked. This story has taken on new meaning for me as I've approached it this way, and I'm grateful for what seems to be a reminder here that the Lord has faith in us, and we need to have faith in ourselves. Now, the Lord didn't tell Peter he should only have faith in himself. Peter couldn't do it alone. Rather, I think the Lord was reminding Peter that together, they could do anything. With the Lord's help and his belief in himself, Peter walked on water. David slew Goliath, Moses parted the Red Sea, Nephi obtained the brass plates, Noah built an ark, Esther saved a nation. If we're willing to trust the Lord and have faith in ourselves, like these examples, there is no limit to the miracles we can be part of in this life. The Lord didn't give up on Peter when he started to sink, and he doesn't give up on us. Joshua 1.9 reads, Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Knowing the Lord is with us can give us the strength and courage to have faith in ourselves, to accomplish great things, even when times get tough. Another thing that has been impactful for me is in this story is the fact that it was seeing the wind that caused Peter to fall. He took his eyes off the Lord, and when he saw the wind, and that's when he began to sink. I don't know about you, but I don't know that I've ever actually seen wind. Can wind be seen? I suppose whatever wind kicks up can be seen, but the wind itself isn't necessarily seen. And yet Matthew notes that it was seeing the wind that caused Peter to fall. I think in our lives, and I found this in my own, it's often the unseen things the adversary tries to get me to see that lead to me doubting myself and figuratively sinking away from the Lord. It's those unseen things that get stuck in my head like Peter, which make me doubt. But if we're willing to focus on the Lord and see him, as Peter did initially, we can withstand the storms of life and accomplish great things. He will consistently remind us of our worth to him, and as we remember that, we will have the faith in ourselves to accomplish the work that he has for us to do. Another example from the scriptures through which I believe the Savior reminds us of our worth came in the days after he was crucified. We read in John chapter 20 that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and was heartbroken when she found the Savior's body wasn't there. The Savior appears to her, but she doesn't initially recognize him because of her grief. Then the Savior calls her by name and says, Mary, which causes her to turn and recognize who he was, the risen Lord. The Savior could have said to her, it's me. But instead of calling attention to who he was, 
he reminded her of who she was. By remembering our worth and who we are, we are more clearly able to see him for who he is and who we are to him. Prior to losing Benny, there was another particularly difficult time in my life when my faith and belief in myself were tested. One night I found myself praying to the Lord that he would bring me home. Life was hard, but I knew the Lord loved me, and I felt that if I could return to his presence, everything would somehow be okay. This is now a prayer I'm incredibly grateful the Lord didn't answer, as I'd hoped at the time. In that moment, instead of calling me home, the Lord touched my heart with the closest thing I've ever had to a vision, a vision that changed my perspective and has buoyed me up as challenges have come in my life, including losing our sweet Benny. As I prayed that night all those years ago, I felt the Lord gave me perspective into my choice to come here. This certainly isn't doctrine, but I share this personal and meaningful experience with the hopes that maybe it may be meaningful for you in some way too. In those moments, I felt I could see the war in heaven. I don't know about you, but for some reason in my head, the war in heaven has always felt very impersonal, like we were all up in heaven together and standing around in an almost pep rally type way where teams were being picked and we had to choose our team in a really loud and chaotic scene. I'm not sure why that's always been my thought on the war in heaven, maybe because we refer to it as a war, which would imply some sort of chaos. Uh, but this night I had a very different perspective. Instead of being amidst a crowd, I pictured a very personal experience with a loving Father in heaven. I pictured him sitting me down individually and presenting to me the plan to follow his son, which would include coming to earth, getting a body, and facing the inevitable difficulties of life. In all of my premortal and angelic exuberance, I picture myself saying, yes, yes, of course, that's what I want. I know I can do it. Send me down. But then I pictured a wise and kind father gently putting his arm around me and in a calm voice saying, but Tiff, it's going to be hard. Life isn't going to be easy. At 20, your first marriage is going to end. At 30, you're going to face the reality of being a victim of sexual violence. At 40, you're going to lose Benny. Are you sure this is what you want to do? I then pictured myself taking a moment, looking at this plan that the Lord had designed just for me, and then with all the faith my eternal self could muster, even more resolutely saying, yes, yes, of course that's what I want. I know I can do it. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, one of the core tenets of our faith is the gift of agency. We believe our agency existed before we came to earth and that we made the choice to keep our first estate and come here. In thinking about that choice and in having this perspective that I believe the Lord blessed me with during that particularly challenging time in my life, I realized that if all life was meant to be was hard, I wouldn't have signed up for it. I don't think any of us would have. But when I made this choice, when we made this choice, I believe we had an eternal perspective that helped us understand that the eternal joy available in and through the Savior far exceeded any earthly pain or struggle we would face. Yes, I believe we knew life would be hard. To what extent, I'm not sure. But I also believe that our eternal selves believed in the Lord and believed in us to face this earth life and come out on top. Whenever my mortal mind starts to doubt, I remind myself of this experience and I trust the eternal Tiffany, who, with a grander perspective, believed in herself to withstand the storms of life with the Lord's help. I'd now like to offer three suggestions that I believe will help us increase our faith in the Lord and in ourselves. First, preparing for miracles. Second, surrounding ourselves with good people. And third, partaking in the power of praise. First, preparing for miracles. Another story I love in the New Testament is when the Savior raises Lazarus from the dead. There are so many things to love about this story, such as the fact that the Savior weeps with Mary and Martha and perfectly empathizes with them in their grief. But as I've been studying this story more in recent months, there's another aspect that I find really powerful. When the Savior arrives at the tomb where Lazarus has been buried, there was a big stone in front of the entrance. And in John 11:39, we read that Christ asked the people to take away the stone before he told Lazarus to come forth. As I've been studying this recently, initially I wondered why the Savior didn't just remove the stone himself. We know he could have. But instead, the Savior first required the people to do something as a witness of their faith. He was about to perform a miracle, but in order to do so, the people had to roll away the stone. They had to prepare the way. He didn't need them to, but he knew they needed to. What stones are in our lives that keep us from the Savior's miracles? As we talked about earlier, what unseen winds are making us doubt and keeping us from getting closer to the Lord? Are there preparations in our lives that, if we made them, would allow for miracles? 
As with anything like taking a college exam, preparation typically precedes success. Sure, we can hope for a miracle, but the likelihood of scoring an A on a test you didn't prepare for is probably fairly low. On the flip side, if we prepare and roll away the barriers, miracles can become our reality. If we want to see miracles in our lives, what preparations are we making to that end? The amazing thing is that once we're willing to do something and prepare the way for the Lord, from getting out of the boat and walking on water to rolling away a stone, our faith in Him will increase when we witness the incredible miracles He brings into our lives. And our faith in ourselves will increase as we see our own strength, willingness, and ability to take action. Second, surround yourself with good people. I have been blessed with so many incredible people in my life, from the family I was born into, the friends who have become family, my incredible husband and the family I married into, the family that I've helped create, and incredible friends in my neighborhood wards and in my work. I know I wouldn't be here if not for the good people around me. Good friends remind us to believe in ourselves even when we don't. Good friends allow us to lean on their faith when our own faith may feel weak. Good friends bring us closer to the Lord in a way that strengthens and uplifts us. Good friends can bring miracles into our lives, like the story we read about in Luke chapter 5. This story tells of a man, a leper, who was surrounded by good people. This leper had a group of friends who brought him to the Savior to be healed. When they realized they couldn't bring him into the home where the Savior was because there were too many people crowding the doorway, they climbed up on the roof, removed it, and lowered their friend down to the Savior to be healed. Talk about effort. Couldn't we all use friends like that? I then love in verse 20 where it says, And when he, being the Savior, saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Because he saw their faith, the faith of this man's friends. By surrounding himself with good people, this man was brought to the Lord and miraculously cured of his leprosy. Surrounding ourselves with good people can help bring us closer to Christ in a way that will ultimately increase our faith in him and in ourselves. In a devotional given earlier this spring, Sister Neil F. Marriott spoke to this principle and referred to the good people around us as our cloud of witnesses. She shared that in the race of life, we need to have a cloud of witnesses who will point our souls to the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. She stated, when life is full of concerns, let's look to the witnesses of the Lord all around us. By surrounding ourselves with good people, our faith in the Lord is strengthened as they point us to Him. And our faith in ourselves is strengthened as they remind us of our worth. Third, partake in the power of praise. As I mentioned earlier in my study of the Jaredites, Ether 6-9 shares how they sang praises unto the Lord all day and all night, and it says they did not cease to praise the Lord. The chapter goes on to say that no monster of the sea could break them, and they eventually made it to the promised land where they again praised the Lord for His goodness. As I noted when I studied these verses, I don't think it's a coincidence that a verse about their strength came after a verse about their praise. In November 2020, President Nelson shared a message with the world about the healing power of praise and gratitude. This worldwide message just happened to occur on the day of our sweet Benny's funeral. And because of that, the words of our dear prophet resonated with my husband and me in a way they may not have otherwise. President Nelson said, no matter our situation, showing gratitude for our privileges is a fast-acting and long-lasting spiritual prescription. As with any prescription, though, the power of praise cannot be accessed unless we're willing to actively partake of it. If we're willing to exercise gratitude and be active in our efforts to praise the Lord, that is when the power will manifest in our lives. There is great power and healing in praise, as President Nelson wisely counseled, and as the scriptures repeatedly teach, a power that strengthens our faith in the Lord as we acknowledge His presence and work in our lives. And when we actively partake of the power of praise, we can more easily recognize our own worth as God's children, upon whom He so abundantly pours blessings and abidingly shows His love. I hope that through what I've shared this morning, you've been able to feel the Lord's love for you and His desire for you to have faith in yourself. If you walk away with anything today, I really hope that's it. I hope you've also felt a desire to strengthen your faith in Him, as doing so will lead to confidence and peace in our increasingly difficult world. And I don't know about you, but any increase in confidence and peace right now definitely feels welcome. By focusing on the three suggestions I've mentioned, preparation, people, and praise, I love that they all start with P, because hopefully that makes them easier to remember, our faith in the Lord will increase, and in turn, our faith in ourselves will increase as well. To end, I want to share one of my favorite quotes that has been attributed to Sir Winston Churchill. 
To every man, and I would add woman, there comes in his lifetime that special moment when he is figuratively tapped on the shoulder and offered a chance to do a very special thing, unique to him and fitted to his talents. What a tragedy if that moment finds him unprepared or unqualified for that which would be his finest hour. My friends, each of you is here on this earth for a reason, a reason designed by loving heavenly parents. You will be given opportunities in your life to do very special things, unique to the abilities and talents that were given to you by those loving heavenly parents. They made you individually and intentionally, and they have a great work for you to do. But in order to do that work, to embrace your finest hour, you need to be prepared with the solid foundation of faith in the Lord and in yourself. And finally, a scripture from Words of Mormon 1, 7. And now I do not know all things, but the Lord knoweth all things which are to come. Wherefore, he worketh in me to do according to his will. Like Mormon, I don't know all things. I can't even pretend to know all things. And in fact, the older I get, the less I realize I know. But like Mormon, I too trust in the Lord and hope that he will work in me to do his will. Being on this campus, I see examples every day of the good he is working through all of you. And I thank you for the strength and goodness and light you share. Each of you was made for great things. And I assure you that as you put your faith in the Lord and have the courage to believe in yourself like he believes in you, there is no limit to the amount of good you can do and the positive impact you will have on this world as you go forth to serve. And I say these things in the name of him on whom my faith rests, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Our eternal Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day that we've come to gather together. We're thankful for Tiffany and her preparation and willingness to share her personal stories of struggle and faith. We're thankful for the spirit that we've felt. We're thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives. We're thankful for the many people who stand as witnesses and examples to us, including thy son. We pray that as we take this message into our hearts, that we will be guided by faith, that we can have the perspective that we need to follow the counsel given and to rise above the challenges and struggles that we face. We are thankful, especially for the atonement of Jesus Christ and for his love and sacrifice and the opportunity for us to change. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. This has been a live broadcast of a BYU campus devotional. The address today was given by BYU Title IX Coordinator Tiffany Turley Bocut. Find links to the full text, audio, and video of this address within the week at speeches.byu.edu. Don't miss next week's live devotional address at this same time with Rachel Wadham of BYU's Harold B. Lee Library. And tune in to BYU Radio tomorrow and every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific for Finding Center, an hour of spiritual focus on what matters most. BYU Devotionals are a production of BYU Broadcasting.